Oh, I guess yeah, this one has Hello, everybody. Thanks very much for joining us today for uh, the Chamber's lunch box session for today. I want to first uh, thank our sponsor, Bell, for allowing us to, to have this meeting and have this happen. Uh, I for you again for taking time on your day to Today, we, it's our pleasure to host and to have with us Heather Watson and Brian Patrick from Naturally Speaking Toastmasters chapter. And going to speak to us about a few pointed topics, uh, preparing for presentations and as well as successful meetings. So with that, I'm not taking too much time, I'll hand it over to Brian and to Orpah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome. As Scott said, I am uh, with Natural Speaking Toastmasters. I'm the current president of our club, and I've been a member of Toastmasters. And personally, I think it's been great to help build and grow and develop my personal uh, public speaking skills. I have with me Brian Patrick, who is our vice president of membership. He has been a member of Toastmasters for so we have a plethora of experience that he's going to be sharing with you today. Just uh, a little information about Naturally Speaking Toastmasters. Uh, we're a Toastmasters Club. We meet every Tuesday down at Enverse Gardens from 12 to 1. So this lunch hour is kind of our time that we uh, will help each other build and grow our public speaking skills. Toastmasters International has two professional development streams. Everybody knows about the public speaking side of things. There's also leadership skills that Toastmasters teaches. And our agenda today is going to touch on both of those streams. So as Scott had mentioned, we're going to be talking about, um, Brian's going to be talking about preparing to speak. So when you have to do a presentation, whether it's before your team or a sales presentation or to whatever group that you're making a presentation to, uh, how to prepare for that. And then I will spend some time on how to conduct successful meetings because that's the other thing we do a lot of. We meet every week and then we're all meeting as individuals. Uh, and then I'll those presentations will open up the floor for questions. So without any further delay, I will bring fire. Thank you. Thank you very much. Start the timer. I got 20 minutes. Go. I feel like Mission Impossible. <laughs> Self-destructive. Thank you all. Thank you again for inviting us, inviting us to your lunch and learn. And as Heather mentioned, we've been a Toastmaster for a few years, 14 years. Joined first in Barbados, where I used to live. Joined the Sun Jack Toastmasters Club in Barbados. And then when I moved to Peterborough, the first club that I joined was the Peterborough Toastmasters Club. Since then, I'm a dual member with an actually speaking club downtown as well. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And even though my profession is in teaching, and therefore standing in front of audiences all the time, and someone may say, Brian, why do you need Toastmasters? It's part and parcel of what you do. Still, I've learned many things over the years. Things to look out for, how you develop those sort of speaking personality or speaking persona, because speaking is not just talking. There's a subtle difference between the two. When you're speaking, you're thinking about things like body language, thinking about things like vocal variety, thinking about things like the use of the stage, the relay, and so on and so forth. There are a lot of facets to public speaking that you roll into your presentations. Today, though, I'm going to talk about everything that goes on before you stand in front of your audience, preparing to speak. And I'm not going to talk about either the actual writing of the speech. That's, again, we take up another hour or two. But there are a few things to bear in mind before we actually get up there to speak to an audience. And the three I'm going to chat about today will be on the panel in front of you. Know your audience, know your venue, and rehearse your speech. So those are the three. Let's start with Well, today I'm speaking with members of the Chamber of Commerce. So I'm speaking with a group primarily, well, even in the sense, very self-motivated, a group that is always part of moving the growth and learn, a group that is entrepreneurial. And so I bear that in mind when I give a presentation like this today. If I'm talking to my colleagues up at Trent University, it may be a different kind of a presentation. If I'm talking to high school students, it may be a different kind of a presentation. 
by talking to the rural community to be a different kind of presentation. By talking to the urban community, you might talking to Democrats, talking to Republicans, it'll be a different kind of presentation. But you have to know your audience before you step into the room. Because you have to put yourself into their shoes and from their perspective to know what will resonate with them. What is it for them? Why am I here? And so quite apart from the demographics, you ask yourself that one very, very key question. Now, not all audiences are going to be sympathetic, and not all government audiences are going to be adversarial. Most of them will probably be rather apathetic. And so therefore, you have to motivate them. Let's take a quick look at those three. If you're dealing with a sympathetic audience, you're primarily there to motivate, inspire, to reinforce what they're already agreed agreement with you. If you're looking at an audience that is apathetic, then you're just really keen on answering that key question, what is it for me? What is it there for me? And sort of getting them on board to give you a list. If you're looking at an adversarial audience, which is quite possible, you may be called out to speak before an audience that may not align themselves with your points of view, then really what you want to do is simply have to acknowledge your point of view. Give a listen. You're not going to necessarily persuade people, but have them give you a listen. And there are techniques for doing this, things like a little self-deprecation at the beginning of the speech, a joke at the beginning of the speech, and an acknowledgement that, no, I'm not necessarily on the same page as you are. And even that simple acknowledgement will kind of break down the walls. Because if you go in there and you start saying, you guys are <laughs> Immediately the walls go up. And the last thing you want to have to do is have the walls go up and people simply just turn you up. So even with an adversarial audience, there are techniques, of course, to have them listen, listen to your points of view. So that's the demographics of an audience. Well, or you may have. And then you gear your message and your speech to that type of audience. Does that make sense? Makes sense. It's something we sometimes tend to overlook. It's something we tend to overlook. And this kind of preparation that I'm speaking of today, this kind of preparation that we do in advance, does one thing that helps many, many people, and that is to simply allay their fears. Because many people will walk, oh, I hate speaking. I'm fearful of speaking. I'm going to get in front of my lines and don't know who they are and so on and so forth. We'll find out. If you're being asked to speak, it will normally be a chair. Scott, the Chamber of Commerce, will ask you to speak. The first question you ask is to speak about who will be there. It's a very simple question to ask. Who will be there? Who will be, who will be coming out to listen? Then you can start crafting your speech. But find out, first of all, why are they there? Who are they there? And that makes takes, again, a bit of that fear out of the speaking. Because if you can prepare in advance, you can focus entirely on just your message and on your speech. You're not worried about the audience at this point. The second is know your venue. Ah, this is it. Know your venue. We had the chance several years ago to conduct a speech prep in this room with the Chamber of Commerce. This would be about eight years ago. Susan Johnson and Peter Rotos asked to conduct a couple of speech crafts here at the Chamber of Commerce. And so I knew the venue. I knew the venue. And when you say know the venue, what do you mean? Well, what's the lighting like? <laughs> Many of you were in here a few moments ago. The reason these lights are off is not because they want to put me in the dark. Maybe there's a secondary reason, <laughs> but because of the noise. There's really quite a buzz to these lights. We were wondering, James, why there's such a light. But when you do walk into a room and walk in, and these are the kind of things you pay attention to. You know, does the air conditioning go on and off? So you're speaking in a voice like this, and all of a sudden it cuts off, and you're yelling at people when it cuts off. Do you have vending machines? Because they can create a fair bit of noise in a vending machine. In fact, one of our Toastmasters once has a room, a kitchen, and a vending machine, and you can hear the machines rolling, the beer machine over there, roaring away in the background. Uh, fluorescent lights can buzz. Is the room hot? Cold. David Letter always keeps his studio cold. Keeps the audience awake, he claims. The temperatures are abnormally cold at the studio. This is NBC. Um, is there a stage? Are you standing above, looking over the audience, if you will? Or are you standing in front of the audience? 
In some cases, you can actually set up the room to your own liking. We had a chance that came in here about a half hour early just to see what the room was like, how the tables were set up, and we were asked how we like the tables set up. I said, well, U-shape is fine. U-shape works quite well. Everybody can see everybody else. Um, is there a microphone? Now it's a microphone. One foot on your lapel, you can move around, or do you have a fixed mic? Do you have a lectern or don't have a lectern? I had a chance and opportunity to speak down at the venue a few years ago for the speaker series. And I asked, is there a lectern? And they said, no, I don't think so. I go, really? They're all <laughs> so if you're actually bringing a speech, you carry it around with you when you're out there, or do you bring your own lectern, like a little music stand? I sometimes just bring a little music stand and sit up there. Or do I have to memorize the whole speech and keep running off on the cop? As it turned out, there was a lectern, and that's where the microphone was. So you couldn't move from the lectern, even though you had a pretty large stage. So these things you want to bear in mind. But I'll tell you one thing that threw me off when I went to the venue. I wasn't aware of was that there was a television camera right there in front of you. Now, what does that mean? They have lights on these television cameras. They light you up, right? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't. No, no. <laughs> we turn them off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We turn. But when you have the lights in your eyes and you happen to be on a stage or something, you don't see the audience. They tend to drift in and out of the fog. So I used to, I saw my dad down there in the third row, and then I didn't see my dad in the third row. <laughs> he drifted out of the fog because into the fog. These are the kinds of little things that can throw you off. But if you're aware of them in advance, just as you're aware of your audience in advance, then again, you remove some of that, we can say, nervousness before you speak. And focus again on your message. And only have to focus on it. It'll be something that might creep up. But you roll with the punches. And to know your venue, the best thing to do is go there. And luckily, with the, in the case of the venue downtown, they asked, would you like to come and see, see the location a few days in advance? I said, definitely. Definitely want to see it. <laughs> Where would we be staying? Oh, there's a blue room in the back, or a green room in the back. And the stage is quite high, actually. So the audience is very much down below. But it does, when you think about it. Could you walk amongst the audience? No, you can't. And you couldn't even move because of the microphone. So those are some of the issues when you're trying to go, no, Venue. The last of the three points I'll chat about today is to rehearse your speech. Now you say, well, that's obvious. But many times this doesn't, doesn't happen. It will get written out. And the person will bring the speech, you know, pull it out of their lapel, and right? you can see the pages coming out, and you can say, sit them on the stage, and they start reading it to you. And you go, OK. But ideally, you sort of want to stand there. You want to engage your audience. You want to have the eye contact. Vocal variety, you want to have the body language, you want to be able to use the stage as much as you can. And these things you rehearse in advance. Like I said, speaking is not just talking. There are a lot of things that go into it. Now you may say, well, how do you keep track of all of this when you're speaking? Well, a lot of it becomes more natural the more and more time you do. And the more you rehearse, the more natural it becomes as well. It sounds like a, like a paradox, right? You think everybody just comes rolling in here just off the street and I give my talk, oh, very natural, very good. But when you listen to very good speakers, they have rehearsed down to the team. I'll give you a couple of examples. I was listening to, this is before I was even a Toastmaster, I was listening to a fellow who was the Vice President of Marketing at IBM. And he gave this speech, it was absolutely hilarious, I thought so. Vice President of Marketing at IBM. It was absolutely hilarious. It was given at the Central Bank. I said, wow, I wish my students could listen to this. And so he said, sure, I'll give the speech. You want me to cut it down? I said, no, 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 give it exactly the same speech as did before. And so he came over to the university, he gave the speech. I suppose if you ran a tape recorder, remember those, and the two speeches, they would probably run synchronously throughout the entire day. Every joke, every interaction with the audience, every slide, everything was down. He knew how the audience was going to react. He had practiced it, he had rehearsed it before probably hundreds of presentations. He knew exactly how the audience was going to react. Same thing with the world champion of public speaking. I was listening to a CD of it. I opted in listening for a while. Next thing you know, I'm at a conference and oh, there he is. 
He gave the same speech. <laughs> word for word for word, every interaction, every joke, he knew how the audience would react and how he would react to the audience. It's amazing. So yes, good speakers do a lot of rehearsal, a lot of practice. Because one of the major fears people have of public speaking is, I'll make a fool of myself. Do you agree? They hate to stand in front of them. See, I'm going to make a fool of myself. Well, to get rid of that, again, in advance, you give your speech. As many people as you can. But to your wife, your sons, your daughter, your colleagues, you practice it out and ask for feedback. So when you do step in front of an audience for real, you have a pretty good idea of what react, what they are, what they are. And again, all of this is done in advance, knowing your audience, knowing your venue, and rehearsing your speech. And by doing those three things, by doing those three things, you can take out a lot of the fear of public speaking. Take a lot of your public speaking because you can focus on, as I mentioned, just the speech itself, just the message. You've taken away a lot of the parameters, the distractions, if you will. You don't get up there and say, oh, darn. There isn't, there isn't a projector? <laughs> you say, no, no, there isn't a projector. Oh, I guess I should have asked. Well, I didn't bring hand up. I thought there was a projector. Or someone rolls into the room with their computer and their laptop and their cables and whatever and decides to hook things up with the projector at the time the meeting is supposed to start. What happens? It doesn't work. It doesn't work. <laughs> oh, this happened at Trent once and only had an hour to sit there. And for the first 20 minutes, they left the room, bought in another computer, hooked it up, and eventually they started 20 minutes late. This is not something you want to have happen. And again, these are things you do in advance. These are all things you do in advance and test out in advance in respect more than anything to the audience. Also, I'll just give a couple of considerations I haven't mentioned down here. One thing you can also do in advance is be prepare your own introduction. People will say, well, doesn't the chair do that? And say, no, you do that. <laughs> you do that. Why? A, <laughs> B, the chair is really too busy to be running around looking for, or trying to figure out who you are and what you're going to say and so on and so forth. You write it down for them, they'll be extremely appreciative that you've done this. And also, too, you write what you want as a lead into your presentation and don't leave it up to the chair to steal your thunder. This happens. You leave it up to the chair, they may say something, say, oh, God, don't say that. <laughs> it's supposed to be a surprise. So yes, you write your own introduction. It's only a paragraph. You send it to the chair in advance and say, here, you can use this. Everybody's happy to go all around. You get the facts straight. You get the lead into your speech straight. And the chair is very appreciative. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. The other thing I have to mention here is prepare yourself physically and mentally. Oh, sleep. <laughs> That helps. I mean, you say physically. But one of the things you bear in mind, too, is something as simple as attire. Again, this ties into knowing your audience. If you're going to speak to some high school students, you may want to address them somewhat more carefully. I did wonder a little bit about the Chamber of Commerce. They said, will they be here in a three piece suits, your ties, and so on? So, okay, so I'm in the middle of summer, probably not. Wintertime, quite possibly. So you bear this in mind. So you feel at ease in the audience feel at ease. Well, again, you don't have any sort of these barriers, these distractions. You don't want somebody looking at you and going, oh, that shirt's not tucked in. Or you'd be amazed what will send an audience off in one direction or somebody off in direction. You catch yourself, right? You listen to a presentation, your mind drifts off. So oh, maybe just for five seconds and you come back. The problem with that is that people only hear you once. And if they happen to miss five seconds, ten seconds, particularly of an introduction, you may lose them for the next ten minutes. So when you are crafting your speech, bear this in mind. It's a little bit of repetition, of referencing, forward referencing, tying thoughts together. Helps. Helps the listener. Helps the listener. Like I said, I can go on for an hour about the actual writing of the speech, but another time stuff. Another time stuff. And preparing yourself mentally is really the question maybe that all sports people will do is visualization. 
You visualize yourself in the venue. You know the venue. Right? You visited it. You see it. You know how it's going to be set up. You just picture a few people up there, and you visualize yourself going up, shaking hands with the chair, giving the presentation, and so on and so forth. I usually try to keep myself yeah. focused somewhere off on the side as I did for exams. In fact, you prepare yourself like you did for exams in many ways. Everybody had their sort of their routine before they went in. But you can do the same thing. You can do the same thing. I think now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Heather Watson. And Heather, as you mentioned, is our president of our Naturally Speaking Toastmasters Club. Works down at the mayor's office as well. Yes, it's Heather Dizzy. And talk, we're talking about conducting a productive meeting, which is more on now the leadership side of Toastmasters International. So please welcome Heather Watson. Heather. to make sure that we're all singing from the same songbook. So I'm going to share with you some of the techniques that we use at Toastmasters to help us have successful and productive meetings. There's five of them. It involves planning. It involves opening the meeting. There is handling the actual meeting once it gets going. Concluding the meeting. And a great one is evaluation. And I think we all lose on that point. I'll speak more about that as we roll around, but it's evaluation and feedback is a key component of the Toastmasters experience, whether you're doing public speaking, you get feedback from your peers from the audience, uh, or if you're chairing a meeting, you get feedback from, from the audience as to how that went. And, and that evaluation is what helps you grow and improve and become better at chairing meetings or better at public speaking. So meeting planning. You think, I gotta have a meeting. Okay, why? What is the purpose of the meeting? When you're planning your meeting, you should be able to clearly state the reason why you want to get bodies in a room or on a conference call or over a Skype or go to meeting, however you're doing it. You need to be able to say, this is why we're doing it. What are some reasons why people meet? Why do I Why do we meet? Issues. To discuss issues? Budgets. Pardon me? Budgets. Budgets. Mm -hmm. Update each other. A bit training. Mm -hmm. right? Share that kind of information. Resolve conflict. Solve problems. Get reactions. Yeah, you, know, you want to pitch a new idea and get people's, get people's feedback on that. Receive reports. Make decisions. These are all kinds of reasons. 
So when you're planning a meeting, you need to be able to say, we are meeting to to our new product launch, or we are meeting to train the team on a new process. One sentence needs to be very clear when you're meeting. Once you state that, stop your planning process right there and ask yourself, do we need to have a meeting? Right? It's kind of that check and balance to make sure that you're on track. If you're just meeting to receive reports or exchange information, it can be done just by email. Maybe you can have a quick call. If it's to resolve conflict, maybe it's not a big, big meeting. Maybe it's just a quick phone call or a basic with people who are involved in that as opposed to a larger group. Which leads me to the next step of planning the meetings of participants. Who is coming to the meeting? Do you want to get the right people at the right tables so that you can deal with that issue you stated right on the top with one meeting? Because there's nothing worse than showing up at a meeting ready to solve a problem or deal with an issue and realize you don't have to have people at the table. You know what that means? Another meeting. <coughs> So when you're trying to build that out, you want to know who has the information that we need to discuss. Who's going to be interested? There's no sense in inviting them if they're not interested in the meeting, the subject of the meeting, they're not going to participate, if you're looking for participation. Um, and also the personalities of those who, are, who you're thinking of inviting to the meeting. So as I mentioned earlier, if there's a situation of conflict, maybe it's just a little a mediation process where it's you know, a supervisor and somebody to help mediate that process, and that's it. But recognize the personality that's already conflict in place, so maybe some prep work time is necessary to make sure that you have a successful outcome. The next thing, of course, is the location where. And this ties into a lot of what Brian was talking about, knowing your room. Yeah, I know often when I'm looking meetings, I'm just trying to find an available space. You know, who's got a space that can hold us? Particularly um, <laughs> in City Hall for these days, it seems. Who, who, where do we have enough chairs to put bums in? But, but really, if you have a bit more flexibility with space, you want to consider, going back to that number one reason, the purpose. Why are we meeting? Do you need a quiet space? Do you need a creative space? Do you need a bright space, a dark space? Obviously, fit is an issue. We want to make sure that everybody can comfortably sit at the chairs and that we're not feeling all crowded. But those are all things that we want to consider. So, because people really act and react differently in, in different environments. And it's important to try and set the tone right from the beginning. The next thing, of course, when you're planning is you want to inform people. Right? But sometimes that doesn't happen. How many times do you get that phone call that says, you know what, we got to have a meeting, you get together tomorrow at 2. But, okay, I think I can fit it in. Well, what are we meeting on? i got to read the reports. i got to give me a little bit of time. So informing people in advance, giving them lots of lead time, preparing them by sending out the reports that they need to read or the articles. Let them know the purpose so they can start thinking about maybe it's to brainstorm ideas and they need a few days just to kind of let it percolate kind of in the back burner there. Um, and also so that um, making sure all that material is distributed but so that people know what's expected of them. Nothing worse than showing up to a meeting and saying, come on up here and share your thoughts on the budget. You know, and all of a sudden you've got to prepare. You're not prepared. You've got to you present and you're not ready. So of course it's important that people know what's expected. And of course your agenda, which we seem to do. We're, I think most meetings I'm at, we're good at setting up the agenda. It's just we don't have enough advanced notice. And sometimes the agendas that I see are just kind of regurgitated from the last meeting agenda. So again, it's not really linked to a purpose. It's just we're meeting because this is what we did last month or last week or whatever. So the second area on um, your successful meetings is your meeting opening. And this is going to be just making sure that we're off to the right start for the meeting. So first you want to establish the right atmosphere. And again, this is what Brian is saying in terms of preparing to speak. Are the lights on or off? Do you have the overhead presentations that you need? Do you have the handout information that you need? Is there, you know, coffee and water and all that wonderful stuff? You want to create that friendly, warm environment. Or maybe you want to create a hostile environment, depending on the purpose of your meeting. But as long as it's time to do what you're doing, just set the 
end up over the time. If you're planning a meeting, that's up to you to do that. Your participants aren't going to plan that for you. Um, of course, you want to start on time. This is a big thing for me. I, I really want to make sure I respect the people's time who show up on time. People who show up on time appreciate that you, show, you started on time. People who show up late, they're going to be somewhat uncomfortable enough that it's not going to happen again. You know, and then they'll sneak in and they'll miss a little bit, but that's okay. It's important to start on time. Um, and then when you first start, you, you need again to make sure everybody's singing from the same songbook, as I said, so update everybody. Take a minute to say, okay, the last time we met or we discussed, or these are the things that led to the reason why we're meeting today. This is the purpose of our meeting, and this is what I hope to achieve from our meeting. So the people know right from the beginning what's expected, what the groundwork is, and that they're all starting from the same spot. Because you don't want to be bringing people up to speed mid-meeting. If you're in the middle of a brainstorming session on, on something, and all of a sudden says, like, whoa, 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 whoa. Didn't we already talk about this, or shouldn't we do this first? That's something you've already addressed. So it's really important to make sure who's up to speed when you're starting. Um, your opening of the meeting, to set the tone again, be aware of your audience and of your purpose. And if you want a fun, energetic meeting, then start off with a fun, energetic If you want something serious, make sure your tone is serious. As I mentioned earlier, you want to introduce what that purpose is. There should be no surprises here because all the people who you went invited to the meeting have already received the agenda and you've explained to them in that communication that we are meeting to solve this problem or to deal with this issue. And, and just do a little courtesy and take advantage, particularly in Peterborough, it's such a small town, everybody knows everybody and we're somehow connected to one another. Maybe not so much if you're if you think you're within your work situation, but if you're bringing in outside people together, take a minute to really welcome them. Let's make sure everybody knows one another. Because there's that kind of awkwardness where you're sitting beside somebody, and you know them, you're sharing ideas, and you just want to help break the ice because things will flow so much better. People will feel less inhibited to share. The other thing when you're opening that meeting is you want to. Um, Kind of set the ground rules for how the meeting will proceed. So, so by that, I mean, like, if it's a brainstorming meeting, are we all just going to have like, free-flowing information and people, you know, taking turns and being respectful, but just sharing information or going around the tables one at a time? Or are you, if you're on the agenda, you speak and nobody else speaks until there's questions? You know, whatever that is. Let people know what the rules of engagement are so that, again, it just sets that tone to be able to deal with whatever the issue is at hand. So the third area of successful meetings is handling the meeting. So you've done your planning, you've set your groundwork, everybody's here, welcome, feeling comfortable, love and light. Now the meeting's happening. What do we do? What do we do? <laughs> Uh, one thing I didn't touch on uh, already is um, in your rules and with your agenda, you're starting at ending time. We talked about starting on time, but ending on time is important too. So make that uh, when you are going through the handling of meeting, you're being um, aware of what time you promised that this meeting would be over. Um, you want to maintain some controls, the chair. So knowing what the objectives are, knowing what the, the purposes of the meeting, you may need to interject and steer the conversation a little bit to get people back on track working towards that, uh, that goal. Get everybody participating. That's why they're in the room. That's why you invited them to be there. So call them and ask them for their input if they're sitting quietly. Um, and, and of course, that requires some tact and diplomacy when you're, when you're calling people out. Um, but that's why they're at the table, because they have information to share. Or you felt that they have something that they need to contribute, and you need to be able to draw that out of them. Of course, promoting an open atmosphere where people do feel comfortable to share ideas. Um, and summarizing frequently. What you're trying to do throughout the meeting is solve whatever this problem is. So you want to build consensus as you're going through. And the way to do that most effectively is to summarize. So you know, you find as a meeting is flow, there will be a little conversation about this issue and it will maybe stem off into here, 
as a chair can bring it back on track by saying, okay, so what I'm hearing here is that there's this other issue that we need to address before we can go back to the main problem. And, and get everybody saying, yeah, because this has been an issue, or whatever the case may be. So summarizing just helps people stay on track, stay focused, and build that consensus. Um, transitioning works really well to move people ahead. Um, again, keeping in mind the time constraints that you have set for the meeting, and you want to be respectful of that, and that you have a goal to achieve whatever that purpose is. So it's, it's important to say, OK, I think we're, we're done discussing this particular issue. Let's turn to the next point, and then transition the conversation. Asking questions as a chair can be quite helpful. It can help guide the conversation. It helps clarify and build that consensus. But it also can help probe for other ideas. You know, just like, well, here's a crazy idea. What if we were to try this? And then it might just kind of spur, spark another light out of the group and get more dialogue going on. Um, and, and, and it's good, as I think I said, this already to involve others. So asking, you know, what do you think, Carol, about this particular idea? And then getting her involved, but it's in a not really threatening way as well. Keeping on track, building consensus, I think I've already touched on that. Planning future action. So as you're going through and you're hearing bits and pieces that are relevant to whatever that problem is, you need to be taking notes and figuring out, okay, step A, B, C. Once we leave here, this is this is our action plan. This is how we're going to move forward with whatever that issue is. Which brings us up to you've had your discussion, you've been taking notes about some possible ways to solve issues. Um, you want to review quickly the problem and the conversation, you know, where you were with, with the whole discussion and what opportunities or issues that have come up in the meeting. <coughs> Summarize that progress that's been made. So that's where you kind of say, you know, this, this is an issue that we need to follow up on and, you know, this department or this person is going to get more information on that and bring that back. Or, you know, summarize some of those key areas in order to be able to have that the outcome of the meeting. Um, emphasize areas of agreement. Not everyone's going to agree on every issue, but areas where they do agree, it's important to really emphasize that. So people feel that there was some sort of positive outcome that's going to come from that meeting. Um, and informing people of the next steps, you know, they're going to be minutes distributed, how soon can people will there be another meeting called, will there be kind of subcommittees formed if that's the case, but let people know what, what's expected. Maybe it was just a one-time ad hoc kind of thing and, you know, you're just going to wrap it up and thank everybody for their time and let people know that they'll see a report down the road or whatever the case may be. If it requires more, more meetings, let people know that as well. And of course, right for their time. Um, and then moving on to evaluation. I've got two minutes to talk about evaluation. So as I said, Toastmasters International, we love, love, love feedback. And evaluation is really important as a chair when you're chairing a meeting to, to know whether or not you were successful in reaching your outcome. So how do you get that evaluation? Set a minute or two after your meeting. Don't worry about the actual objectives of the meeting and all that kind of stuff, the work from the meeting, but evaluate your own performance. Ask yourself, you know, did, did I engage everybody? Was it well planned? Was the room, you know, just kind of go over all those um, touch points that I've already spoke of and ask yourself if it worked or what didn't work. Why not? You can also invite an observer into the meeting, somebody who's just going to sit and watch and, and give you some sort of feedback on the flow. Um, and of course, ask the participants for feedback. I have an evaluation form, which I can share with you. And I would love your feedback. If any of you want to take some time and fill it out um, on both Brian and my presentations. Um, but this is also a great sample evaluation form that you can use when you're evaluating whether or not your, your meeting that you conducted uh, was successful and uh, identify some areas for improvement. And I think, with a minute and a half to spare, <laughs> I am done. So at this point, Brian, I will let you take the floor. Take the floor, take the floor and lead us.
end of um, Q and A. Oh, or yeah. Oh, okay. I wasn't going to grab somebody's lunch. Oh my God! It's oh my God! It must be good. As Heather mentioned at the very beginning, Ghostbusters and your have had two streams. The speaking, the communication stream, which I think most people are probably familiar with or recognize Ghostmasters for. And the other one being the leadership stream. Interestingly enough, the model of Ghostmasters International is where leaders are made. And that was a that generated a bit of actually that didn't say anything about speaking at all. It just said where leaders are made. But I think being a good leader requires being a good communicator as well. So it's implicit in the model. In order to communicate your ideas well to those you work with, in order to motivate those you work with, to persuade those you work with, to present information to those you work with, are all required communication and good communication skills. And so where leaders are made, that's the model, but of course it implicitly assumes, subsumes, that you have good communication skills. And I think it's still important. Even today, I know we have our we have our texting and we have our emails. But when you think about oral communication remains what I always call the most intimate and powerful form of communication, the face to face. Even so. And even today. The other tools can augment the, those communication skills to keep people connected, but still people will gather when important things are to be discussed, when important things are to be decided on in meetings that Heather has presented today. Are there questions with regard to anything with respect to either the leadership side or the communication side? I know we've talked about a few things like you know, lightning speeches, but we didn't get into it. But you may still have a question regarding something like this. Our meeting, we meet every week. We meet every week. Both, both groups? Uh, there's actually three groups in town. There's the Good Morning Toastmasters, which meets, well, guess. <laughs> at 7.15 at Cisco Foods every second Tuesday. I think it's the second and fourth Tuesday of the month. The Naturally Speaking Toastmasters is the noontime group, the one that Heather and I are members of. And it meets at Empress Gardens, right downtown every Tuesday at noon. For an hour, it's a jam-packed hour. The clock gets done in the morning. The other club has just celebrated its 50th anniversary. You may have heard it on the news. We had Mike Judson, I was our guest speaker, uh, back in late May, maybe around since 1964. Same as Tim Hortons. <laughs> the same as Trent University. <laughs> And the same as the Ford, and the same as a as a Ford Mustang. Peterborough Toastmasters meets at seven o'clock on Wednesdays at the Knights of Columbus on Ruby Street, and they meet for will generally be a two-hour meeting. They will generally meet for two-hour meetings, and so every week, for two of those clubs, they meet every week, and for the other one, they meet just every two weeks, every second week. Excuse me, second, right? Yeah. I think. Well, if, if I understood your question, you meant like in terms of the leadership and the communication side of Toastmasters? No, no, I just like, you answered it correctly. Okay, perfect. Okay. And we will tackle both of those kind of things within the meeting itself. In fact, we are conducting a meeting, and you're, you're the chair. And the chair, remember, we have different roles in the meeting. They alternate around. We have a chair, we have a general evaluator, we have evaluators, we have speakers, we have a table topics master, and so on and so forth. That rotates every week. And so you will have the opportunity to chair meeting, to put together the agenda, to get your everybody is there, to fill any any spots that happen to become vacant because someone can't make it, so on and so forth. Yeah, you get the chance to be chair. You get the chance to speak whenever you wish, because it is a self-paced organization. You you go and you have a chance to go. You will speak when you wish to have a chance to speak, and you will fulfill roles when you have the opportunity to come out. Fulfill those roles. So yes, it is self-paced. We have manuals to go along with it, so that's the educational part of it. There's the evaluation end of it. You, every speech gets feedback um, from both all the members of the club. I will sheet of paper, and they'll write back their feedback. Plus, you'll get a formal evaluation from one of the Toastmasters 
who will stand up for two or three minutes and give their own evaluation, their own impressions of your speech. Bear in mind, it's the personal impressions of the evaluator. And that is, to me, the most challenging skill there is. Speaking is in your hands, right? <laughs> you write the speech, you rehearse the speech, you choose the topic, and so on and so on. You meet the objectives of the speech and the manual. Being an evaluator, you listen to the speech how many times? Once. And you got to focus, and you got to pick out how the objectives were met, what the speaker, the questions I asked, what did the speaker do particularly well, and how can you make the speech even better? And that's a real challenge. And to be able to present it in such a way that it's not threatening, not discouraging, but encourages it to move on and do even better the next time. That is really a skill. It's one of the things I've learned and I take with me to my work. I evaluate all the time for teacher. And so when the student comes in, you always start off with on a positive note. <laughs> Again, you don't build walls, right? As soon as you go in there and start criticizing right away, boom, the walls go up. <laughs> and people tune you out. But if you walk in and say, you know, I really enjoy this. I really did. Seriously, I think you're on the right track. But to make this even better, to really nail it home, this is what I would suggest. Give it a whirl. But bear in mind, these are just my suggestions. You never say things like you should. <laughs> you avoid the word should and you avoid the word you. You personalize it to I. I might have tried this, I might have tried that. What do you think? And so, yes, evaluations are a tough part. And the other one you have to mention when you, is the table topics and the things. Speaking off the cuff. Thinking on your feet. Someone put the microphone in front of you. How do you handle that? And I often think, well, it's not so much speaking as it is writing on your feet, because you're actually imposing a mini speech on the fly. It's almost like writing on your feet. And writing is a thinking act, as opposed to just delivery. Questions? Other questions? Other questions? About anything. Yes, go ahead. My question is most of the time in both public speaking and the meeting. I often try to plan too much in a meeting. It's right. unfair. I think I really honed in on having a specific purpose for a meeting, but sometimes you have a lot to accomplish. And you also have you know, maybe particular people who really want to talk and we both go in a meeting. <laughs> um, and you don't want to only uh, I mean, you do want to address that and, and take in their opinions, but sometimes I have trouble hearing from everyone and accomplishing the entire agenda. Or in the same way, when I'm speaking, I'm trying to cover too much topic. I guess it's hard. I guess I'm looking for direction and, and really being okay with refining it down to a realistic time. I'll talk about the speaking while I have other talk about the meetings. So many things are fresh. We do time our speeches. We know ahead of time this is a five to seven minute speech. This is a, this is a, Period. Five to seven minutes. It will tend to go quickly. People always say, I hate speaking. How can I fill up five to seven? Believe it, they will. <laughs> this generally is not a problem. Five to seven minutes. The problem is cutting it down to five to seven minutes and being coached and getting your point across in five to seven minutes. Because when you speak, people will typically forget most of what you say. 90% of what you're saying, don't forget. They'll walk away with a feeling, not a great speech. If you probe them and say, well, what did they talk about? Uh, something about this. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, just the way, that's just the way it is, often. So as a speaker, when you sit down to write your speech, and I don't want to get into the writing, but turn it over to Heather, you write down, what is the message I want to get across? And you write it down in one sentence. And you craft the entire speech, all the supporting points, all the facts, all the figures, all the antidotes, around the one point and reinforce it throughout the speech. So when they walk out of the room, they walk out the message that you want to leave them. And then, of course, rehearse, rehearse, rehearse to make sure it's between five and seven minutes, or three and four minutes, or one minute. That's how you know. You sit there with your watch. <laughs> And you actually rehearse it out and know down to the second how long this is going to take. But with respect to meetings, but yes, right yeah, with respect to meetings and keeping things on track and on time, because you want to make sure that people are being heard and sharing those ideas, but you also want to keep things moving along. It's it's everybody knows if you state right off the top, this meeting is at one o'clock, which we're getting close to cut off time. 
But if you say that right off the top, then people are really generally respectful of that. So we don't want to be the ones responsible for holding up everybody else. So as the chair of the meeting, for you to say, uh, Heather, I appreciate what you're saying. I want to give other people an opportunity to see. Uh, you, you've got some really great ideas. Maybe we can connect one on one afterwards. And for her those remarks, if it is something like that, and let other people speak in that way. Or just, you know, hey guys, this has been a really great conversation so far, but I want to be really conscious of the time. I want to respect your time. Can we move on to the next part of the agenda? Keeping your agenda really to things is probably the key. Well, that's our back to the planning side of things as well. And, and like Brian says, people will fill that time very quickly. So if you think it's only going to take five minutes to discuss this little part, or whatever that little part is on your agenda, oh, that part 10. Um, <laughs> you know, really create that buffer. So when you're planning it, maybe it's on an hour meeting, you can it's a two-hour meeting. Um, and, and that's OK, too. But then when you're in that meeting, wrap people up as, as you need to do so. Yes? How do you engage people who are reluctant to speak up and you never know their opinions without directly calling them out and saying, how do you feel? Well, I, I mean, directly calling them out is probably the most effective way to do that. Um, also, when and we've all been in this in a room before where people are going around the table, right? So you're not you're calling them out directly, but they know that their turn is between this person and this person because we're starting to go. <laughs> But but it gets them engaged and reinforcing their their thoughts um, when they do speak. So uh, when somebody does volunteer information, who you know doesn't typically do that, say you know that was a really really great idea. What do you think about this as well? Or but to to reward them and make them feel so that it is comfortable and it wasn't too painful. So next time they'll do it, but they're more inclined to offer it again. Any other questions? Yes. How many members are in your group versus the uh, Peterborough Toastmasters group? I'm not a member of Peterborough Toastmasters right now. Alan actually speaking club has currently 21 members. Meetings vary anywhere from about 10 people who can show up to a meeting to about 15. Um, and it rotates with people. People are busy and um, can't make every single meeting every single time. I'm not sure about Peterborough. Peterborough Toastmasters now has somewhere between 38 and 40 members at this point. And I think the Good Morning Postmaster is around somewhere between 10 and 15 in the morning. Thank so you. The biggest group is the Peterborough Postmaster. The they historically be the largest group. And then actually speaking, it's usually been between 20 and 25 over the years. Very, very safe. Yes. So uh, it's good to know the numbers. Of what, could you speak to the demographic and use the clubs if you can? Um, happy to talk to you perhaps afterwards, oh. um, just because I am aware of the time, um, and it, it does it does vary. Um, but yeah, we can chat about it. And, and anybody, and any of the three clubs uh, welcome guests uh, at any of the meetings. You can go to any meeting with any club three times. And then if you're interested in joining Toastmasters, I would encourage you to, to do that because it may not just be the time of day and the day that it meets, but the dynamic and the demographics of the group um, where you feel more comfortable. It's pretty varied. It really yeah. is. Okay. Really pretty varied. It's from early 20 year olds, folks who are retired, uh, from, from, general <laughs> motors, from general motors to air conditioning to teaching to lawyers. To, yeah. uh, you name it. it Nursing, we have just about all kinds of demographics in this day too. So it's a very mixed audience, it really is. All right, thank you. Great. Did I see the keenness coming out of the Yankee? Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 this is how you end the meeting. No pressure. Heather and Brian, thank you both for your time. Interesting, uh, being in a meeting and having a hearing discussion about presenting. And uh, plan a meeting sort of gave me the feel for what you maybe can relate to that watch a movie and see an actor or actress being an actor or actress within the movie. Now, here's the experience. Um, certainly can comment firsthand in terms of organizing this meeting how fluid and seamless that process was from my perspective from yourselves. It involved the asking of a few quick questions and all the setup you talked about. Um, didn't feel exhaustive. And I want to make that comment because the process can be seamless, can be simplified, and yet. I think 
you know, um, cover all here. You need to plan these things and obviously deliver effectively, which we'll all agree this is a very effective delivery. So thank you both very much. Um, from a financial community perspective, I would fall into the category of probably having too many meetings, and we're constantly trying to own that. Uh, both from our internal perspective and our clients' time. Um, but interestingly enough, despite that fact, reflecting in this, there's a number of things we don't do very well consistently, and I don't do very well consistently. Uh, I think we, it's something we just absolutely miss, even though we have so much of that. Maybe you can to that as well. But certainly here today, one of the things I did not do is let you know that my name is Scott Mancini, and I don't work on a real chamber. So this is why I'm here and talking to you. Um, on behalf of the chamber, I want to thank all of you for your time today. Thank you for coming in. Uh, also, I'm going to recognize our sponsor, Bell, with it, which this would not be possible. Um, a couple of quick things in terms of chamber agenda. Hopefully, uh, you've been before, but this is your first lunchbox during the meeting. Um, we are increasingly getting uh, more and more uh, poignant in terms of our members want to see you serve our members actively. And the topic here today is, is a good example of that. On September 17th, I couldn't agree more in terms of how the role of verbal communication is still a mainstay. I would actually say is actually coming back in a cyclical manner in terms of the business world anyway. However, social media is a also mainstay and a growing one in terms of how we communicate. And on September 17th, we have Sophie Andrea, um, who is actually going to be presenting to us about marketing through social media. So hopefully you can join us for that as well. And Chad, I think you had a quick update as well. Yeah, um, so September 10th, we have the Prosperity Trade Show. I see several people who are registered already. If you are interested in getting a booth, there's a few left. Um, so the show's coming up. There's usually 100 plus exhibitors, around 1,000 people. Great way to get out one of our largest events of the year. Uh, and then on September 13th, we have the Chamber Corporate Run coming up. Um, PUC is here today. They are a 10K race sponsor. So um, it's a new event for us, uh, and I, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I know there's several people who have some sore uh, calves training up for it right now. So get your shoes ready, get a team together, and register and commit one with us. Thanks. Thanks, Thank you all again very much. Have a great day.